You are listening to the Bethel Church Sermon Podcast, a ministry of Bethel Church in Yale, South Dakota. If you would, turn your attention to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John, we find ourselves in chapter 8. John chapter 8. If you would, stand with me as we honor the the reading of Scripture together. I'll start in verse 12. That's where we're going to spend our time today. I'll read through verse 18. Again, Jesus spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are bearing witness about yourself? Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, Even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I have come from and where I am going. But you do not not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet, even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law, it is written, the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we focus our attention on Jesus coming into the world, as he is proclaimed, the light of the world. Lord, I, I pray that we would that we would see a couple things. I pray that we would see clearly the world in which he came into, the darkness. Lord, and I pray also that we would see Jesus in the light of the midst of that dark place. Lord, I, I pray that we would see our need For Jesus, the darkness of our own soul. How Jesus is the the light for us. Lord, I pray that we would see clearly the world around us, the darkness that exists in our world, and the need for Jesus around us. And that we would be compelled to go, to share, to proclaim Jesus as the light of the world. Lord, we pray that you would accomplish these things and much, much more. For the glory of Jesus, and we pray it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. I, I wouldn't call myself a frequent flyer by any stretch of the phrase, but I've had an occasion to fly, and I've always landed safely. And of course, there's always a, a bit of relief, though, when you, when you land safely. Sometimes if it's rough, some people on the, the plane will even uh, clap. Uh, illustrating that, that relief. Uh, I, I, uh, there's been a, a few occasions in which I've, I've uh, flown and landed at night. Landing at night is really a, a pretty cool experience. Everything is so dark, you can't see anything. And then all of a sudden, as the, the plane gets lower, you start to see the, the lights of the, the city. And as it gets lower and closer to the, the airport, you see lights there, the, the runways are, are lit up, and all of a sudden you start to see the, the runway that you're going to land on, and it, it gets bigger and bigger, and pretty soon uh, you know right where uh, you are, right where the ground is, you know when you're going to, to touch down. And of course, the bigger the airport, the more light there is. I read a story of a a missionary who was going to another part of the world and that the airport that he landed at, if you could call it an airport, it was a runway, it didn't have runway lights. Not at all, it was dark. And as he was looking out the window, he couldn't see the ground, it was just darkness. Till all of a sudden, he hit, he landed. There's a, a spiritual image here, isn't there, there uh, that, I, that I think is, is rather clear. Here is a, a missionary flying into a, a place where he's bringing uh, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ to a very dark place. 
It is the imagery of so many Christians that have ventured into a dark place with the light of Jesus Christ. It is the image that we see throughout uh, the New Testament in Paul's missionary journeys. He travels uh, to places that are spiritually dark, that are in need of the, the light of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But even earlier than this, the prophet Isaiah speaks these words when he writes this. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of deep darkness, on them light is shown. Clearly, in the Old Testament, the light was a, a picture of the coming of God to save. David said it or sang it this way in Psalm 27, verse 1. The Lord is my light and my salvation. And here, Jesus, in the 8th chapter of John, comes and declares, I am the light of the world. What Jesus is saying here is that the world is dark, it is spiritually dark, and that he is the light of God's salvation. And I think to understand that, that second part here, we need to understand something of the first, and that is the darkness to which Jesus stepped into. He's going to light something up if he is the light of the world. Darkness in Scripture is seen in, in various ways. We could talk about it from uh, a, a number of different aspects, but let me give you just, uh, I, I think, four here. As, um, it is seen as a, a realm or a, a world of ignorance and folly. Uh, listen to, to Psalm 82, verse 5. They have neither knowledge nor understanding. They walk about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Think of uh, Micah chapter 3, verse 6, where we are told, Therefore it shall be night to you without vision, and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go out on all the prophets, and the day shall be black over them. Over and over, the, the image of, of darkness without the, the voice of God speaking. Ignorance and folly is seen as not hearing from God. That the world is in darkness, meaning that it's given to ignorance and folly. Because it does not listen to the voice of God. It is lost in superstition and it seems like they flee from truth. In, in the West, we've been blessed. We are, we are people that are uh, intelligent. God has made us uh, with intellect. We are blessed with educational opportunities. But yet, as one scholar put it, we grope about in the darkness making decisions and enacting policies that are contrary to the wisdom and even in a lot of cases, contrary to, he, to common sense. I, I mean, we could look at the newspaper today and see a, a host of examples of this. Just things that, that are going on that just lack wisdom. They're, they're brought from ignorance and folly and they just lack even common sense. It's because the world we live in is dark. We're not listening to the voice of God. Darkness is, in scripture is also seen as a, a realm of evil and fear. Why is it that children fear the darkness? Why is it that darkness seems to uh, make us uneasy? It's because danger lurks in darkness. Proverbs 4, we read that the way of the wicked is like deep darkness. In John chapter 3, this is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people loved darkness rather than light because their works are evil. I mean, I don't even have to give an illustration of the evil that exists in our world. This is why in some places people don't go to certain parts of town after nightfalls. It is because they know that evil exists. But even more than this, it isn't, that, it isn't just in certain parts of town. It isn't just in certain times of day. Evil exists everywhere. And as John said it, people love darkness. Why? Because their deeds are evil. In other words, they, they love the evil and therefore are not looking to the light. Again, they're not listening to the voice of the one who has come to save them. Our world is characterized by evil. It's characterized not only by evil, but it's characterized by people who love it. Yet at the same time, this is a fearful thing. For instance, everybody knows that, that murder exists. There's those who, who kill other people. 
We know this is a reality, but yet somehow most of us just go about our, our daily life and we don't worry about these things, but yet uh, when a woman is, is killed in Alabama, uh, when she's out on a, a, jug, a jog, it sparks uh, a lot of uh, conversation and it sparks a lot of fear in that city, but not just in that city, in the nation. Because we see a glimpse of the darkness of the world in which we find ourselves in. Darkness in scripture is also seen as a, a realm of captivity, of misery and death. In Isaiah chapter 8, verse 22, uh, we read this, and they will look to the earth and behold distress and darkness, the gloom of anguish, and they will be thrust into thick darkness. Later on in, in chapter 59, he speaks of being in darkness and uses that same word gloom again. It's no wonder that darkness is used to describe the Israelites' time in captivity in Egypt. It was a dark time. In Ephesians chapter 6, Paul speaks of this present darkness when he's speaking about the, the cosmic powers that rule the world today. There's a, a great captivity to sin. We are in bondage, a slavery to, to sin, and this brings nothing but misery and death. This is what characterizes our world. Bondage, misery, death. And one of the unfortunate consequences of many in the, in the Christian world is this overemphasizing of free will to the, uh, in fact, so that not only are we saying that humans are free moral agents and able to make real choices, but they would go so far as to say that we're free to choose right and wrong. It's that, that there's freedom to choose Christ on one side and, and we're free to choose the path of sin and unrighteousness on the other side. This emphasis is so unfortunate because it isn't biblical. Obviously, you and I are free moral agents. We make real choices. But the Bible speaks of sin as, as or this world as, as being in bondage to sin. This is why we speak of freedom in Christ. In, in Christ, we're free from something and we're free from the bondage of sin and death and misery. You see, the one who is in bondage to sin isn't free to choose anything except sinfulness. And to suggest otherwise is, is nonsensical. Martin Luther made this point well at the end of his response to Erasmus called uh, the bondage of the will. He said this, and I quote, I frankly confess that for myself, even if it could be, I should not want free will to be given to me nor anything left in my own hands to be able to enable me to endeavor after my salvation. Not merely because in the face of so many dangers and adversaries and assaults of devil, I could not withstand my ground, but because even if there were no dangers, I should still be forced to labor with no guarantee of success. But now that God has taken my salvation out of the control of my own will and put it under the control of his and promised to save me, not according to my working or my running, but according to his own grace and mercy, I have the comfortable certainty that he is faithful and that he will not lie to me, that he is so great and powerful that no devils or opposition can break him or pluck me from him. Luther's point is well taken. That even if she, we should want and desire free will, we really shouldn't. We shouldn't desire it because then all of this rests squarely on our shoulders. And if things rest on our shoulders, there is no guarantee of salvation. But with Christ, with a true gospel of grace alone, there is guarantee. And the guarantee is Christ himself who both met the demand of the law for us and then bore the weight of God's wrath on our account. He alone has done it all and he alone is the guarantee. The world of darkness, we should also say, is under the, the judgment and destined for the wrath of God. This is the, the world that we find ourselves in. It's a, a realm of darkness, which means that it is under the judgment of God and destined for God's wrath. In Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 15, 
A day of wrath is that day, a day of distress and anguish, a day of ruin and devastation, a day of darkness and gloom. When Jesus was speaking of judgment of sinners in Matthew chapter 22, he speaks of them being bound and cast into outer darkness. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, we read that the wicked will be cut off and placed in darkness. Now, I want you to see something else here, and that is what is true of, of this dark world, the realm of the world that we find ourselves in, is also true of every life that exists apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ. The fact is, the darkness of this world isn't just out there somewhere. It's us. It's in us. The ignorance and the folly. It's us. The evil, the fear, that's us. The the bondage to sin and death. The misery that goes along with it. In fact, we are all under the judgment of God. That is true of every person. We are destined for his wrath. And apart from Christ, this is us. And it is in this context that Jesus steps into the temple court and declares, I am the light of the world. It's a marvelous statement. We should note at this point that Jesus' statement here is the second of his I am statements. There are seven of those in the Gospel of John. We've seen uh, one already in chapter 6 where Jesus says, I am the bread of life. That phrase, I am, just to remind you, is an an implicit claim to deity. By saying I am here, Jesus is, is claiming himself to be God. Not not equal to God. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Not equal to God. Not elevating himself. It's not some form of hubris. But it's him claiming to be God. It it points back to that scene where Moses finds a, a burning bush that is not consumed. And God reveals himself to Moses and says, Say to the people of Israel, I am has sent me to you. So so Moses goes to the people of Israel. He tells them, the great I am has sent him so that God, this great I am, will free them from the captivity that they are in to Egypt and he will take them to the land that is promised them. Who sent them? The great I am. And now Jesus stands in the temple court and declares himself to be the same great I am. Who is it that freed the people of Israel Israel from Egypt and that oppression. Jesus. That's what he's saying. I am. I'm the one that was there in the burning bush that talked to Moses. I am. But in this case, he he comes with news that he's not going to deliver them from bondage to worldly powers. He won't deliver them from their bondage to the the powers that are in in control, into the Roman oppression. He's not there for that. He is to free them from the bondage of sin and death. Deliver them from the present darkness in which they find themselves, the ultimate oppressor. We've already seen John make reference to Jesus as the light. We've we've read a a reference already. We've seen this a few times. Some wonder about this and why John does this, but it's clear that John's drawing from what he knows to be true, and that is that Jesus is revealing himself to be the light of the world. The light has come into the world, but people ignored it. They didn't want it because their deeds were evil. It's so fitting that when Jesus does this and makes this statement that it happens at this point. If you remember back before the the story of the women caught in adultery, the context of events there is the the Feast of Booths or the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, one of the events at this festival was called a a Festival of Lights. Now, what would happen here is that there was four large candelabras and each uh, with four golden bowls filled with oil as their fuel and they were lit to light up the temple court. And they would light up the entire temple so you would see it. So now after the feast is over, the the oil is run out, the light is gone. But most likely, these candelabras are still there in the temple court. And it's here that Jesus comes out in reference to those and says, I am the light of the world. In other words, Jesus fulfilled what the festival symbolized. 
Notice that Jesus doesn't suggest that he is a light. He's not on equal par with those. He isn't symbolizing something. He isn't pointing to a greater reality, but he is the light. In other words, all of the rejoicing that the festival of lights produced, the reason for that rejoicing was actually Christ. That's what he's saying. These lights in the festival, they go out. They're there for a time. They go out. They point to a much larger reality, and that reality is the true light that never goes out, namely Jesus. So why the lights in the temple court? If Jesus is suggesting that he is the fulfillment of what all of this symbolized, what does it symbolize? Well, the light celebration during the Feast of Booths recalled how God guided and protected Israel during their time in the wilderness after they left Egypt. The pillar of fire by night, the cloud by day that guided them. This was the, this was the symbol of the, the light. The festival of lights pointed toward this reality that God guided and protected them. He took them to where he was taking them. Now, the, the cloud is important. And James Boyce lists this three ways in which this cloud was, was important. Let me just share those with you briefly. Uh, the first reason this, this cloud in the wilderness was important is because it, it symbolized God's presence with the people. One thing that is difficult for us to understand is, is living in a place that doesn't have a lot of artificial light, or really any. Living here... As we do, it is different than living in a city, but there's still some pretty bright lights around. I'm very thankful for that. It makes it much nicer when I'm walking to the church at night. But these in the desert, there, there was no light like this, except for the, the great cloud. And this is something that we would call a, a theophany. Just listen to, to Exodus chapter 13, verses 21 and 22. And the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud to lead them along the way. And by night in a pillar of fire to give them light. That they may travel by day and by night. The pillar of cloud by day, the pillar of fire did not depart from the people. I want you to notice a couple things here. First, the, the Bible says that the Lord went before them as a cloud. It isn't that the Lord sent a cloud to go before them. This isn't... But this is the Lord. A theophany is a visible representation of God. For instance, the burning bush that was not consumed. It was God that spoke to Moses from that bush. There are other examples, of course, but just uh, for now, notice that, that this is the Lord's presence with the people of Israel. God didn't just free them and then just leave them on their own. But he was present. He was there with them. The Lord was, the, the cloud was always there. The Lord was always there with them. In the daytime, in the nighttime, as they were camping, it was there. Just think about what Jesus is saying when he claimed to be the light of the world. He was claiming to be God, the I am statement, but he was claiming to be present with his people. I am the God who is with you, he is saying. The cloud was also important because it was a source of protection. Not only was the desert dark, but it was dangerous. Without the cloud, the people would have died long before they entered the, the promised land. They would have died from, from human enemies like Pharaoh or the, the natural dangers in the desert. So at this point, there was like two million people during, and, and during that, in that region, during the day, it would get up to about 140 degrees. And at night, it would get below freezing that the temperature swings were very drastic. These would have needed uh, water. They would have needed shelter from the sun if they were going to survive. And we know that God provided water from a rock and the cloud sheltered them from the sun and it was over their, their camp. The cloud was important because God was present with his people. It was a source of protection for the people. It was also important because this is how God guided his people. These people needed a guide. 
They needed to follow something. There were few landmarks in the desert. The desert produced mirages. The distance is always uh, very distorted in the desert. It was difficult to find their way. It would have been easy to to wander off into a dangerous place or even start uh, traveling in circles. So God led them. And when the cloud moved, the people moved. And when it stopped, they stopped. In Numbers chapter 9, it is very interesting to to read about this. It's quite fascinating. It's a a pretty long section, so I'm not going to take time to read it. But sometimes the the people would stay in one place for days or even weeks because the cloud would not move. And other times, they would travel by day and by night. When the cloud started moving, so would they. It all depended. Their travel all depended on him who guided them. And now when you start thinking about this in reference to Jesus' statement about being the light of the world, we realize that it is Jesus who is God with his people, that he will be there to protect them. For we are in the hand of God. And also, he is there to guide them through this dark world. So when Jesus is standing in that temple court and he is proclaiming to be the ultimate presence of God. And he will say this in just a few verses. In verse 19, Jesus says, You know neither me nor my Father. If you knew me, you would know my Father also. Jesus is God on display for these people to know and experience his presence. He's their source of protection. And he is their guide. They remember the the cloud, the the light that was the the presence of God, the protection of God. It was God guiding them and they they look at that and they trust that, they they embrace that, they rejoice in that. But here Jesus Christ is, is standing right in front of them who is the fulfillment of all of these things. And the question is, is will they embrace him? And the answer to that question is no. Ultimately they kill him. So Jesus proclaims that he is the the light of the world and then says this, whoever follows me will not walk in darkness but will have the light of life. Now if there's any doubt as to the the context of Jesus' statement, this seems to to put it into rest that he's pointing back to to the cloud, to to Israel traveling through. Certainly Jesus is speaking about these things around him and the things that are pointing back to The presence, the protection, the the guiding hand of God in the wilderness. And here Jesus says clearly, I am the true cloud. I am the true light. You are to follow me. And if you do, you will not remain in spiritual darkness. So there's a question here that I think is, is very important. And that is, what does it mean to follow Jesus? If Jesus is our guide, he leads us, then we are to follow him. We hear statements all the time these days. It is possible to refer to to Christians as as Christ followers. So I I think it's helpful to to understand that that statement just a little bit here and and think about what it means to follow him. It's helpful to to look at how that word follow is used in the New Testament. It's used in various ways. It's used of a, a soldier following a commander into battle. It's used of a a slave who attends to his master. William Barclay says this, Always the slave is ready to spring to the master's service and to carry out the tasks that the master gives him to do. The word follow is used of one who accepts the wise counsel of another. It is used of one who is being obedient to the laws of the state. It's used for one who follows the reasoning of his teacher. J.C. Ryle summarizes it this way. To follow Christ is to commit ourselves wholly and entirely to him as our only leader and savior and to submit ourselves to him in every matter, both of doctrine and practice. I love that statement. To submit ourselves to him in doctrine and practice in what we believe and what we do. Jesus says, in essence, I am the light of the world. Follow me. Trust me. Believe in me, and I will be with you. I will protect you. I will guide you. Follow me. In our world today, much like the the world of Jesus' day, there's a a great many other things to follow. In fact, 
Jesus didn't seem appealing or necessary in the world in which Jesus found himself at the time. And it's the same today. The people didn't immediately embrace his claim. Just like today, but there's a few that did. Peter, James, John, Matthew. Matthew, the the tax collector, I think is a superb example In his life, we probably see the the lure of these other things, the the clearest. The desire for wealth and, and status. But Jesus comes up to him and says, follow me. And we read that he left everything and he followed Jesus. My friend, I want you to grasp this because it's so important. The only way that we will ever follow Jesus like that is first by believing in him, by trusting that he is who he claims to be, that he is the light of the world, that he is the light of life, that he is the only way out of the darkness that we find ourselves in, that he is the only remedy for the bondage, the misery, the ignorance, the folly, the, the judgment, and the wrath that is to come. He is the remedy. The answer to all of this is Jesus Christ. To, to look to him as the remedy for our sinful condition is the only option. He realizes that he came to save us out of this. That Jesus Christ is God in flesh. And that he lived perfectly where we failed. And that he died the death that we deserved. And was raised again in life in victory over death. So that you and I could one day live forever with him. It is trusting that Jesus is the protector of those who come to him in faith. That those who believe on him will never face condemnation. For these... The wrath of God has already been satisfied in Christ Jesus. This is why you you follow him. I, I find it so tragic. Those who advocate following Jesus as the remedy or the the solution to the, the world of darkness that we find ourselves in. You live in a dark world, follow Jesus. Obey. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. One must believe and and trust. And then they, they follow. John the Baptist, I think, is a good example. Remember when he was pointing his followers to Jesus, he says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. In other words, he's making a statement. Jesus, he's the one who is worth following. He is the ultimate sacrifice. He is the great sacrificial lamb that will end all sacrifices. He is the sacrifices that all of these things pointed to. He is the sacrifice that we must trust in. We trust in him And we follow him. We cling to him as our guide, as our protector. He is always with us because we are united to him through faith. What I'm saying here is that there are some who will advocate following Jesus. Or what I mean by that is being obedient to the commands of Jesus as the solution to the darkness that we find ourselves in. As a solution to the sins that that reign in the human soul. My friend, that remedy is found only in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Not in something that you can do. And no amount of following Jesus is ever going to save you. What will save you is to cast yourself on the mercy of Jesus. To trust in him alone as the one who took your sin upon himself. Who paid the price for it so that you would not. And the more we understand what Christ has done for us, the more we long to follow. The more we long to submit. I'm not downplaying sanctification. I'm not downplaying growing in godliness. I'm just giving the proper motive for Christian growth. Yes, obey. Yes, submit. But not as a solution to the problem. The solution to the problem is remedied in Christ Jesus. And because he is that solution, submit yourself wholeheartedly to him. I gave you some ways that the word follow was used in the New Testament a few minutes ago. The one that strikes me here is the slave-master relationship. In fact, this is a common designation for believers in the Bible. Slaves, the Greek word is doulos. And the reason for this is that this person, this slave, recognizes the supreme worth of the master. The master has come to earn such respect so that when the slave is actually free, he submits himself willingly to the master. 
And the more we understand this, the more we contemplate and rest in what Christ Jesus has done for us, the more we see his value, the more we know what he has done for us, and and the the gospel is, is real in our daily life, the more we freely submit and follow where he leads. Proper motivation for growth is important. So yes, submit. Be obedient. Trust in Jesus Christ. Trust in what he has done. Contemplate the the darkness in your own soul that he has saved saved you from that that evil, that, that fear. That he's, he's, he's freed you from the bondage of sin and death. And he now is, has come to be with you always, to guide you and to protect you. Let's pray. Thank you for listening to this sermon resource from BethelMBChurch.org. If you'd like to learn more about Bethel Church or find other resources, please visit our website at BethelMBChurch.org. Bethel Church exists to bring glory to God by promoting the joyful worship of Jesus Christ both here and abroad.